over the meaning of some trivial song. Let that be a lesson to us all. This evening I shall present some music by our new young operetta composer, Herr Arnold Schoenberg. Herr Schoenberg is the one playing the cello in this band. By the way, Fritz Kreisler is the violinist. So to begin, the story of a young lover who takes T. 
tea with his girlfriend. I'll use 
the morrow. When one is good at one thing, it's foolish to try something else. about our beloved Kaiser not wearing his crown. He has a uniform for every hour of the day. Army. like to slip into something loose after confession. Oscar Strauss, our beloved musical director, not to be confused with that dreadful Richard Strauss who does such horrible things with orchestras. Oscar Strauss thinks Herr Schoenberg has a great future as a composer of waltzes. Who knows, if Herr Schoenberg applies himself, he too may write an opera ball.
and brightly lit, Casper in the middle sits, mounted on his horse. Kings and dukes around him come, other side the public can, big bass drum goes bum bum bum. of her chicken to always defeat me. Since I have seen so many men, my heart is not so hard to please. It passes on and on relentlessly, just like a swarm of bees. And if his
will be served upstairs.
Kia ora. My name is Janet Heffernan and I'm an opera ballet TV producer here in New Zealand. Welcome to Auckland in the 21st century, a beautiful, clean, fresh, modern city in the South Pacific, which, thanks to the miracle of modern communication, is now very much part of the world. But only a few years ago, in the 20th century, Auckland was a very different place. Air travel was expensive, communications with the rest of the world were either by snail mail or expensive toll calls, Colour television only arrived in 1975, and videos and DVDs were unknown. Auckland could have been on another planet, cut off from the rest of the world. Professional opera and ballet performances, although popular, were few and far between. Visiting superstars rarely visited, and if they did, it was usually at the end of their careers. But musically, Auckland at that time was an exciting place to be. It was vibrant, young and enthusiastic. There was a blossoming of young and talented performing artists with ambition and drive. New Zealand is famous for its artistic exports. In the 50s, ballerina Rowena Jackson took London by storm. In opera, Kirite Kanawa, Donald McIntyre and Inia Tawieta became international opera superstars. Ah, those Antipodean voices. But many, and in some cases more talented individuals, stayed at home. It was to this exciting city that my husband, Dr. Miles Heffernan, an Oxford-educated GP, came to work. And I came too. We both had a passion for serious opera and ballet, and when in London, lived at the Royal Opera House. But he needed a new challenge, and so did I. I had had a successful career in London. I trained as a professional ballet dancer and spent my early teens as a child in the Royal Ballet at Covent Garden. A privileged position as Nanette de Valois didn't normally allow children to appear on the stage. It was a superb balletic, operatic and musical education. I mixed and learnt from the finest artists of my time. I was chosen by Benjamin Britten to appear as Mrs. Sem in the first performance of Noah's Flood alongside the young Michael Crawford. It seems that my performance was outstanding and unknown to me, I became a star of the 1958 Albra Festival even appearing like a young Charlotte Church at a special Wagner Abend as a surprise item, accompanied by Britton himself. Britton had been looking for years for a young girl to play Flora in his masterpiece, The Turn of the Screw. He had already auditioned 40 potential Floras for the premiere, but had to make do with a small adult soprano of 50. He vowed that the screw would never again be produced until he found his perfect flora. He wanted a young, intelligent 15-year-old who could cope with both the extremely difficult part and the sexual connotations of Henry James's novella. I had no idea then, and I expect neither did he, that I was to become his first young flora. Shall stay the same. That's right, my darling. How good you are. Go to sleep. From the moment when I met him, 
when I auditioned, singing for the greatest English composer at that time, the most unfortunate of musical songs, The Fairy Pipers with Actions, and in the next breath told him how much I enjoyed Gloriana, The Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra, and the ballet The Prince of the Pagodas, we struck up a relationship. He never batted an eyelid or showed any signs of hilarity as I sang my slightly risque song, as it was so unsuitable. But I realised, many years later, that serious composers often have a lighter side to their character that is often overlooked. Britain enjoyed a good giggle. Airy fairy pipers underneath the merry moon Come, come Britain and Piers could give a very good cabaret performance and did so on several occasions. And Ben, as I was told to call him, was great fun to be with and had a wicked sense of humour. When asked which character he would like to be in Noah's Flood, he thought, grinned and said, Mrs Dove. In Auckland, I discovered a group of young, highly motivated musicians who were capable and keen to perform some of the world's greatest and most difficult masterpieces. A performing artist must perform. They can't wait until they're dead to be appreciated. I had been enchanted by the Albra Festival. Once a year, this old, bleak fishing village on the coast of Suffolk, where Britain lived and wrote Peter Grimes, hosted a small but elite music festival. I thought something similar could be mounted here in Auckland. Some brave and educated ladies had sat down in front of the council's bulldozer and saved a tiny brick pump house from demolition. This pump house was in the most perfect setting, on the edge of a volcanic lake, Surrounded by bush and black swans, it was a perfect venue. Britton, who knew I wanted to be an opera director, told me that the impresario Diaglef, when he'd run out of money, had spent six months in Spain, where he had directed his operas and ballets to a single piano. It seems these were the performances that Diaglev enjoyed the most, as he had for once total control, which he never did in large theatres and companies. I had very much enjoyed Les Mamelles de Theresias, which was performed with a two piano accompaniment, Britain playing one of the piano parts. Unfortunately, Poulenc failed to turn up. This is a bawdy, risky piece, and again showed me Britain's great sense of humour. He also made his partner, Peter Piers, into the May King in Albert Herring. History does not record what Peter thought about that. I had met a 21-year-old soprano, Wendy Dixon, who was a fine musician, had a strong voice and was an accomplished actress. She had played the child in our first production, a staged version of L'Enfant et les Sortilèges by Ravel, teamed with Ravel's Scheherazade. She was brilliant, and I was looking for another work that would suit her abilities. Once on a train to Albra, I was introduced to Schoenberg's operatic masterpiece, Erwartung. The soprano was learning the difficult solo role. I was fascinated by it, and I could see it was difficult, but ignorance is bliss. This is the work I thought would be perfect for Wendy. Wendy jumped at the opportunity to tackle perhaps the greatest lyric work, for a soprano of the 20th century, even though we could only do it with a piano. This would be the main feature. It was only 27 minutes long, so I had to find an opening item. Nowadays, a Wartung is usually paired with Bluebeard's Castle by Bartok, which I produce later. But this was my first venture into the world of opera production, and even though I was young and self-confident, I felt that this double bill was a bit of an ask. 
Eight songs by a young Arnold Schoenberg had just been released. These had never been published in his lifetime, and when I became acquainted with them, I realised why. They were simply called the Brettel Leader, or Cabaret Songs. The description sounded very ordinary. In fact, they sounded rather dull. When they arrived, I was in for a shock. I could hardly believe my eyes and ears. Here was a very different Schoenberg from the one one reads about in scholarly tomes. A very different Arnold Schoenberg indeed. These in Berlin, where he worked in 1901 as the conductor, were a surprise and a revelation. It seems that underneath it all, our Arnold had a racy sense of humour and an ear for a good tune. He had a true appreciation of the vulgar and a penchant for double entendre. I, for my sins, had spent a year in London in an intimate West End review. These reviews were considered the cream of the crop for musical artists. Satire was in, and the small cast of eight had fun taking off and cruelly sending up many of the current celebrities. I remember I was Vanessa Redgrave, a red, red, Redgrave girl, with a costume I had difficulty staying in. Margot Fontaine and Marjorie Proops, the agony aunt, were also among my characterizations, and I closed Act One, the best spot in a review, in a black bias cut Dior dress with no bra, sending up male perfumes. Root, Old Spice, and Moustache. I collected no end of fans, perfumes, flowers, chocolates, the lot. It was all deliciously vulgar in the best of all the worst possible taste. It was a privilege to work in the West End. One has to have a sound sense of the ridiculous, be somewhat of a rebel, and willing to take outrageous chances to perform in this sort of intimate review. It is risky. We were forever being censored by the Lord Chamberlain's office. And so, I found out, was Schoenberg. Poor Frank Wedekind, the famous playwright, even got put in prison. I began to like Herr Schoenberg even more. He was of the people and to whom I could relate. Had he chosen to, Schoenberg could have outstraussed Johann, Oscar and Richard. At the beginning of a creative career, artists are often forced to take unfortunate jobs just to survive. At 18, I was capable of directing Erwartung, but I was forced to work in London musicals. Britain had to work for the post office film unit and Schoenberg, it seems, for the Uber Brettel Theatre. All jobs in later life one would rather forget. Eight years later, Schoenberg wrote Erwartung, perhaps the definitive lyric work of the 20th century, of which he is its foremost composer. After Schoenberg, nothing musically was the same again. Why not stage the cabaret songs as a prologue to Erwartung? The two genres were poles apart, and yet Schoenberg was master of both. I never let the fact that no one had done it before, or it seems since, stop me. With my background in musicals and review, I thought I could create a mise-en-scene that might be appropriate for a literary cabaret in Berlin at the turn of the last century. Twenty years later, James Levine of the Metropolitan New York has the same pairing, Erwartung Cabaret Songs, on his CD with Jesse Norman. So I was on the right track. William Dart was the classical pianist I had engaged to play Erwartung. I asked him, and he just said yes, for which I now realize I shall be forever grateful, as I know that no one else would have accepted, as it is so difficult to play. Anyway, he turned out not only to be a classical pianist, but an accomplished jazz pianist as well. He too had a secret side to his nature that I knew not of. He was absolutely perfect and could cope with both the sublime and the ridiculous. William too has a wicked sense of humor and entered into the spirit of the piece. William Dart is a truly remarkable man. He is senior lecturer in music at Waikato University and he has run a radio program on Concert FM for 26 years 
featuring a quirky selection of popular music. But he also publishes and edits the foremost art magazine in New Zealand. Art New Zealand features all the fine artists in an erudite and enjoyable way and is a must read for all art lovers in this country. As well, Dart finds time to be the classical music critic for the New Zealand Herald, for which he writes many articles. His knowledge of classical music, jazz, pop and fine art is astounding. All I had to do now was to find a cabaret singer who could do these songs justice. This was not difficult. A beautiful opera singer with a ravishing voice, who fortunately had not deserted Auckland, was available. When I first heard and saw Louise Malloy perform, I was bowled over. I had seen one of the first performances of Kirit Kanawa's debut performances as the Countess in The Marriage of Figaro, where she brought the house down by her beauty and presence and voice. But here in Auckland was another singer of such stature. As well as opera, Malloy had played the leads in many musicals. She had the right credentials and experience to do justice to these songs. Vocally accomplished with a ravishing top range, a beautiful figure and again a sense of fun which is necessary for the tongue-in-cheek songs. I was fortunate to meet one of the finest costume designers I have ever known. Remember, I was dressed in London by some of the finest theatrical designers. Elizabeth Jenkins had trained in theatrical design in Croydon. She designed and made two of the most glorious costumes I have ever seen. The mise-en-scene was mostly my drawing room and my daughter's canary. I used a melange of colour slides to add to the effect. I even used some film of the Kaiser. This was the first time that this had been attempted in Auckland and it was met with a barrage of criticism from the local critics who were not amused. Where was the painted canvas scenery? On the last night, we just did three performances. The lighting designer suggested I had the performances videotaped. This was the best suggestion he ever made and the best $400 I have ever spent. It is these tapes that you are now seeing. Sadly, the original colour cameras of 20 years ago, although far more expensive than today's consumer models, were far from perfect. Lastly, I must thank the Schoenberg estate for the rights to make this performance of Schoenberg's cabaret songs on a rather blustery night in an old pump house in Auckland, New Zealand, available to the world. Evartum, the best production I have ever done, is coming soon. Enjoy. If woman cannot love a man, then she's neither cold nor warm. She lies there just a block of ice and never runs true to form. But I am quite a different girl, a rather helpful, friendly girl. My heart I gratefully unfurl. It happily goes come, 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 come. Wait for it. If you have enjoyed this program, you may be curious as how it came to be made. Programs like these are considered uncommercial and seldom produced as they are time consuming and expensive. Fortunately, today, modern technology means that anyone can make and market TV programs, movies and documentaries. 
All you need is one of these and one of these, a little know-how, a passion for making television programmes and time. Making television programmes in the traditional way is ultra expensive. So to make money, most commercial TV programmes and films are aimed at the 29-year-old male, as this is what production companies believe is their most lucrative market. That's fine if you are a 29-year-old average male who likes professional wrestling, motor cars, sex, violence and computer games. But not so good if you like opera, ballet, bookbinding and croquet. Please hang up and try again. Over the past few years, all has changed. Today, anyone who is passionate about television or film can make acceptable quality television or video movies at home using just the basic edit program on a home computer and an ordinary DV camcorder. So what can you produce at home? Here is a sample of some of my TV programmes that I have been able to make available to the world from my home in New Zealand via CreateSpace DVD On Demand and Amazon.com. Restoring the Family Bible, presented by master bookbinder Peter Goodwin, who started as an apprentice bookbinder with Boots the Chemist in Nottingham over 64 years ago, was my first attempt. The next thing is, now having got the brass edge binding off, we have to now remove the cover from the book itself, just so we can get at the, the spine area to see the state of the sewing. And we'll cut through the, the cloth joint with a knife and that uh, allows the cover to drop off there and do the back and now the book is out of the case is removed usually you find a lot of debris and all sorts of things inside which you don't want the way of dust the dust of ages silver fish sometimes appear book binding is a dying craft the onset of glued spines and the brittle book syndrome. It seems every book printed after 1850 has a built-in destruct mechanism, it means traditional bookbinders are no longer required. Peter Goodwin is one of the last true journeyman bookbinders still working at his craft. Bookbinding is something of a mystery to many book lovers. I didn't learn how a book was made until later in life, and I thought many people like me would be interested to see how their precious family Bible, which is most probably falling to pieces, is restored. Reminds me of the days in the army when I was using polish and cleaning army boots. I used to use a whole tin a week on two pairs of boots. This was the first of what has proved to be a popular series and four other titles followed. Bookbinding does not translate well to the printed page. One has to see how it is done. Repairing the humble paper back, demonstrating how to put the pieces back together at home, was the next. The account book showing the Springback Ledger, which is the tour de force of a bookbinder's art. An 1819 atlas, a huge half-bound leather book. And lastly, the full-bound leather book, which is the epitome of the bookbinder's craft.
All this knowledge would have been lost unless someone took the initiative and time to film a master bookbinder in action now. Tomorrow is too late. Today, there are many subjects of social history that could and should be filmed for posterity. And with a little time and effort, anyone can do it. Virtually everyone has a story to tell or a skill to pass on. The Cabaret Songs and Erwartung by Arnold Scherberg are good examples of social history. They show what was being produced in Auckland by a group of young professional singers and dancers in the 1980s. Against all odds, and with very little money, these intrepid performing artists produce some exceptional performances which are still acceptable today. No government grants meant the establishment took little notice. They were airbrushed out of history. But the evidence of one's eyes proves just how special this group of artists were. But for the fact they were videoed as keepsake, their brilliance would have been lost and the world would be poorer. Next, the Kidalt Ballet television series Dance Tales Story Ballets, which were based on my highly successful original children's holiday shows. Dance Tales Story Ballets were a collection of short fairy tales with the added attraction of a celebrity narrator. These were hugely popular with the public, filling town halls and large theatres. Well, we'd better practice a tiddly pom thing. I'll just count to three and then everybody says tiddly pom. Ready? One, two, three. Yeah, about four times louder. One, two, three. That's very good. No? I even won a TVNZ marketing award. These were my one journey into the world of commercial mainstream production. It took four years of my life and was a major battle, as women at this time were not wanted on voyage. But it was shown on the BBC and finished as a finalist in the LA Monitor Awards for Best Edited Programme. With trembling fingers she lit one match. At once, it seemed to become like a magic taper and in its light, she thought she could see a huge shining fireplace. Oh, oysters, come and walk with us, the walrus did beseech. Oh, we cannot do with more than four uh, to give a hand to each. But try as she would, the poor girl could not sleep. All night, the naughty pea prodded and poked. That little Red Riding Hood did not feel at all afraid. She had made a fatal mistake, for she had met a wolf. The series is now used in schools as resource material in countries like Australia and New Zealand that include dance in the compulsory curriculum. These two are now available to buy or borrow from the web and libraries worldwide. You just have to ask. Just ask at your local library or online movie distributor. They are a perfect introduction to children of all ages to the wonderful world of classical ballet. I found the experience of making my own TV program so enjoyable that I have made a short program showing how you can do it yourself. Have you ever wanted to make your own television program? I have. It is surprisingly easy to do, much easier than you think. And once learnt the possibilities and opportunities to share one's life, passion, interest, life story are endless. If you can write an email, you can make a TV program. A picture may be worth a thousand words, but a moving picture is priceless. Five years ago, I had not touched a computer. 
My husband had retired and I was enjoying life and my stamp collection. I had had a successful career in Auckland producing opera and ballets and I thought that was it. But my husband died suddenly and I had to go back into the workforce. Not easy to do at my age, but I thought if I could harness the power of iMovie and make a live CV to show what I could do, I might get employed. But first I had to master the edit programme. Getting started is a big learning curve, unless there is someone who will show you the basics quickly, easily and painlessly. The first thing I found out about computers is that nobody is going to show you how to use one. Teaching myself iMovie was an experience I should rather forget. Three hours with a help tutorial was painful, especially as I lost the lot because I forgot to save. But I persevered, and I found that actual editing is so easy that I want others to do the same, but without the horrible learning curve. Hence, do-it-yourself TV, learn TV and movie production in 44 minutes. Virtually the basics of film production can be taught in less than an hour. Well, 44 minutes to be exact. This knowledge will get you started, and from there on the sky is the limit. Today's consumer DV camcorders are better than any camera of 1980, and the video track of any basic edit program that comes with your home computer is the same as the video track on any professional edit program. It is only the sound that is different. So now I hope you will be inspired to make live CVs and items for YouTube, as well as sharing your passion with the world as a full-scale documentary. I have thoroughly enjoyed making this program, and I hope it will give you the confidence to have a go. It was not difficult, and the more interesting TV programs, the better. One day, these programs made with love and time will become valuable social history assets. Now, all I have to do is to roll the credits, export to camera or DVD or what you will, and it's a wrap. Bye-bye. Dare she light one of her matches? Perhaps that would warm her a little. With trembling fingers, she lit one match. At once, it seemed to become like a magic taper. And in its light, she thought she could see a huge shining fireplace. was warm and inviting and the flames seemed to beckon her come and be warm come and be warm by the blazing fire. Too late, the fire disappeared, leaving the little girl shivering with a burnt out match in her hand. The 
sound of carols reminded her again of Christmas, and she felt even more lonely. What if she lit another match? Once again, the match burned brightly, and this time, wherever the light fell on the wall, it seemed to her that she could see through, into the room beyond. of children burst into the room and the little match girl recognized the child who had tried to help her. The children were looking for Dr. Drosselmeyer who always appeared as if by magic. Dr. Drosselmeyer brought wonderful presents. This time, a toy theatre. The children were so excited, they could hardly wait for the curtain to rise. The little match girl watched too. She had never seen a stage before. The curtain rose on the sugar plum fairy. Sugar Plum Fairy in a land of sugar and spice. to dance like that, said Clara. You can do anything you wish, if you want to. Try, said Dr. Drosselmeyer. And a pair of ballet shoes appeared on her feet. She started to dance. Her 
brother Franz laughed at her. After all, only girls dance. But he too found he was dancing and enjoying the experience. The next moment, Franz and Clara were dancing with the sugar plum fairy. And Clara thought she looked very like the little match girl that she had tried to help.